He was once the most dominant pitcher in the game. JR was on his way to being the best pitcher I'd ever seen. Poster child for a Hall of Fame pitcher. Then suddenly, a life-threatening injury ended his career. And that wasn't the end of his misery. He was out living just a, a step above an animal. His story is next. The following is a special presentation of MLB Network Remembers with Bob Costas. The story of J.R. Richard. Any list of the best pitchers of the 1970s would have to include Steve Carlton, Tom Seaver, Catfish Hunter, Jim Palmer, Nolan Ryan. But there's at least one other who deserves to be considered. A pitcher who had as much talent as any of them. It was 30 years ago that his career was abruptly cut short. But as you'll see, his story is about more than just baseball. He had more strikeouts in his first big league start than Steven Strasburg had in his, and he was six months younger. The most dominating right-handed pitcher I've ever seen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was a fastball at better than 100 miles an hour. He's one of five pitchers in baseball history to have back-to-back -back 300 strikeout seasons. When he was at his best in the late 70s, few, if any, were better. 6'8", 250. Sometimes there were teams he would throw his glove on the field virtually. It was all over. He's not in the Hall of Fame, but that doesn't mean he isn't remembered by those who played with and against him. And he is remembered with something approaching awe. For me, I don't know that there was ever a more intimidating pitcher than James Rodney Richard. The story of J.R. Richard is a tale of promise and accomplishment, followed by setbacks, decline, and tragedy. But for a time, there was greatness. He was special. I always thought that he was going to be the best pitcher ever. There was a life-threatening injury. That was one of the most tragic things I've ever seen in sports. A descent into hopelessness. You're the most known person in sports, and then all at once you're nobody. And ultimately, redemption. You get up and live, or you lay down and die. Don't blame somebody else because something happened to you. Through it all, when baseball people are asked about him, there's always this question. How good could J.R. Richard have been? It's one of the saddest things in the history of sports because this guy was headed for the Hall of Fame. It was September 5, 1971, two years after the Astros drafted J.R. Richard with a second overall pick. Houston was playing a doubleheader against the Giants, and J.R. was starting the second game. It was his Major League debut. He was 21. I didn't think about the Willie Mays, the Willie McCovers, anybody like that. Because I figure, man put his pants on one leg at a time. Of course, me, I jump in my pants sometimes. After about the third inning, they they were pretty much beaten by him, especially the right-handed hitters. I mean, Mays didn't want any part of that. Willie was back on the bench yelling at him. He's saying, hey, Willie Mays, he showed him the back of his thing. You can't strike me out three times. He's talking about three straight times. J.R. Richard had a complete game victory with 15 strikeouts, tying Bob Feller's record for most strikeouts in a big league debut as a starter. J.R. had five Ks in his next start against the Reds, and five days later, he punched out nine Braves. His 29 strikeouts in his first three starts was a major league record that stood for 39 years until Steven Strasburg broke it this summer. Unlike Strasburg, Richard had major control issues early on, and it would be three and a half seasons before he'd become a regular part of Houston's starting rotation. But once he got there, J.R. Richard was dominant. Shut your eyes and be ready to bail out. If that can't intimidate you, nothing can. You know, I can remember talking to players on other teams where they talk about how players get J.R.-itis. You saw a lot of cases of J.R.-itis. You know, if somebody woke up with a stiff neck and somebody else had a fever or a cough or something like that, they didn't, they didn't want to be out there. Big guys, I mean, Hall of Fame guys, they didn't want to play. They took their days off when J.R. was pitching. At 6'8 and over 250 pounds, J.R. was, in fact, an imposing presence on the mound. And there was something else just a bit scary about J.R. Richard. He is so strong. He's got the, he's got the most uh, ferocious handshake 
uh, that I've ever encountered. He's just got mammoth hands. Uh, as a PR guy at the time, uh, we had him uh, had him pose for a picture, I think, holding eight or nine baseballs in one hand. He has eight. He put nine balls in his hand. Dink, 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 and he went like that. And we took the picture and made a poster out of it. Once we saw that, everybody tried to see how many balls they could hold in their hand, and I think I could hold three or four. I don't think I could hold seven golf balls in my hand. From 1976 through 79, National League hitters really didn't like facing J.R. Richard. He won 74 games in that span, the most by any right-hander in baseball. In 76, he won 20, and in 78 and 79, he led the league with back-to-back 300 strikeout seasons. I had two pitches, fast and faster. At my best, I could throw it through a car wash and never get it wet. As good as he had been up until then, 1980 looked like it would be J.R. Richards' best year. With his control much improved, he came into the All-Star break with a record of 10 and 4. He was leading the league in strikeouts, and his ERA was 1.96. The other years leading up to that were, were certainly very good and dominating, but 80, he was, was just absolutely invincible. J.R. was chosen to start for the National League in the 1980 All-Star game. That night in Los Angeles would be J.R. Richards' last great baseball moment. It's July 8th, 1980. The All-Star Game is at Dodger Stadium, and the Astros' big right-hander J.R. Richard is the starter for the National League. After four straight years of 18-plus wins and back-to-back 300 strikeout seasons, J.R. is having a great first half in 1980. That year, I thought J.R. was on his way to being the best pitcher I'd ever seen. And everything seemed set for his big national moment. He was throwing 99, 100 miles per hour in the twilight. You know, as the sun was set. The two-strike pitch to Fisk. Gone. Richard pitched two scoreless innings that night and had three strikeouts. The most memorable came against Reggie Jackson. It was power against power. 3-1 coming. 3-2. I threw Reggie Jackson a slider on 3-1. Uh, and, and he asked Johnny Bench, what in the hell was that? Because he had never seen anything like that before. 3-2 coming. Bench chases him. He's out. Reports the next day said several of Richard's pitches were clocked at 101 miles an hour. That All-Star game got him national attention. But something wasn't right. He has been experiencing stiffness in his right forearm. He uses the word fatigue to describe it. Since early June, J.R. had been complaining about a tired arm and numbness in his fingers. I had consulted with Astros about, I'm not feeling right. But they say, it's all in your head. He had to come out of games a couple of times because his arm went dead. And everybody's thinking, how can you throw like that with a dead arm? I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what. However, J.R. kept pitching and he kept winning. Then six days after his all-star turn, he took the mound against the Braves in the Astrodome. He was pitching well, but with one out in the fourth, he had to be removed. Again, he complained of a tired arm. And again, doubts were raised about just how legitimate Richard's complaints really were. When he got on the mound, he could throw, he was throwing pretty hard still. So everyone would think that he, if he can throw that hard, how can he be hurt? There was some sort of a communication gap. You know, he'd come out of the game in the sixth inning and they'd have pizza up in the clubhouse and he'd say, my arm is numb and I'm sick to my stomach. And then he'd go up there and he'd eat two pizzas. Well, if he's gonna eat two pizzas and go fishing, you know, why can't he pitch a couple more innings? I don't think they understand me and uh, that's their opinion. Uh, I think some of the guys, basic guys that know me, the guys that, that's on the ball club that know me real well, they know I'm not dogging it. They, they know I don't go out there and dog it. The players weren't the only ones who were skeptical. A lot of the folks in the media, myself included, we doubted him. We didn't think, you know, maybe he was just giving an excuse. Nobody really could figure out how much of this was real, how much of this was imagined. Other factors added to the uncertainty surrounding what, if anything, was wrong with J.R. Richard. There were rumors about his off-the-field lifestyle and reports of drug use. He got caught up with the fast track, uh, so he was not always taking good care of himself. And some of JR's teammates say there was another more subtle reason for all the doubts. We go back to the to the old adage that uh, you know if you're a black ball player, you got to you got to stay healthy no matter what. 
if I would have been white at that time, would I have been treated any better? And I think the answer is definitely a yes. I don't believe that I would be the first one to say yes if I thought so. I played in Houston in 1960-something, so I know what that questions about racism and race is. It wasn't the same in 80. With all these issues hovering around him, the Houston Astros were still sure about at least one thing. They believed J.R. Richard was healthy enough to keep pitching. There's no chance of him hurting himself seriously. He's agreed to pitch, so he's pitching. I think the type of tired arm he's got is better that he work regularly. If I was such an important part of that organization and they care so much, why wasn't I taking care of him anymore? I really think that the, the medical staff and the club did everything possible to try to, uh, to put JR in a position where, where, uh, where his health came first. But the pain in JR's arm only worsened, and the Astros eventually put him on the 21 day disabled list. That was in late July of 1980. JR Richards' career and his life were about to change forever. I felt so great that day, it was unbelievable. And all of a sudden, I just felt a loud, high tone ringing in my ear here, a high pitch ringing, and I laid down on the Astrodome floor. And I said to myself, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, which I kept on repeating to myself, what's wrong? What's wrong is a huge blood clot that's created a massive blockage in an artery. J.R. Richard has had a stroke, and he's immediately rushed to the hospital. There, life-saving emergency surgery is performed to restore blood flow to his brain. Today, as we prepare for baseball, all of our thoughts are on James Rodney Richard, who had suffered a possible stroke, his once brilliant future right now very much in doubt. I got word on the road that JR had collapsed while playing catch, and uh, there was a long medical statement that was drafted by the physicians that, uh, that I had to read at a press conference. At this time, the patient has shown some steady improvement in motor function, that is movement involving both the upper and lower extremities, and also has appeared to improve from the standpoint of alertness and cooperation. A CAT scan of Richard's brain later shows that he has experienced three separate strokes from different obstructions. His left side is paralyzed, and he's lost his power of speech. He was being wheeled through the hospital here in Houston, and it was just shocking to see the way he had lost weight, he was thinner, uh, he couldn't talk. It was very, very sad to see. JR is also diagnosed with a condition known as arterial thoracic outlet syndrome, the baseball consequence of which is that he could start a game and be fine, but eventually blood constriction would cause his arm to numb. At the time, his wife tells reporters, it took death or near death just to get an apology. They should have believed him all along. I think it stinks, and I think long after J.R. Richard recovers from this stroke, and he will recover, I think long after that, the scars in his heart from this despicable attack by certain writers who wrote certain articles will live with him forever. And I cannot measure, and words cannot measure, the hostility and the disdain that I have for those certain people that wrote those pieces in a continuing onslaught against this man. And I went on the air. I did a public apology. I said, I'm, I apologize for not believing him. I was wrong. I was among those who wondered what was really wrong with J.R. Richard. I was among those who questioned his intentions publicly. I'm sorry for that. Many of JR's teammates also publicly apologized. There's a lot of guys sorry for what their thoughts were about, you know, way back a month ago when he was coming out of ball games early. And, and I think everybody just uh, owes JR Richard a big apology. I guess it, it just really teaches a lot of people a lesson, and, and I hope that it doesn't, uh, you know, take one person's career to teach somebody a lesson. I think everyone, including myself, all learned a very valuable lesson that when any athlete is complaining of numbness or a tired limb, you better pay attention. Please tell JR that our prayers and the prayers of all baseball fans go out to him, his wife Carol, and his five children. Rest well, James Rodney Richard. The vindication of JR Richard was complete, but it had come at an enormous price. I remember visiting JR in the hospital and really seeing uh, 
you know, up close and personal how, how, how devastated he was and how devastating this issue was. Couldn't put blocks together, squares over squares or circles over circles. He couldn't put them together. He had to almost start all the way over again, living his life from like a, being a baby to a grown man again. I had to relearn how to walk, speaking, talking, and uh, all of that that was meaningful to me in life to get it on. Despite how bad things were, J.R. Richard vowed to pitch again. Well, I'll tell you what he told me. He said, Carol and I will pitch again. And that took care of that for me. What J.R. couldn't have known at the time was that before his life would get any better, it would get a lot worse. The doctor's uh, convinced that you're completely recovered from the stroke. Well, not totally, but I'm on my way. What still uh, is the problem? Time. Six months after his collapse at the Astrodome, J.R. attempted his comeback. J.R. Richard was a star pitcher for the Houston Astros when he suffered a stroke last July. Most people doubted the 31-year-old Richard would ever put on a baseball uniform again. But now he's at spring training camp trying for a comeback. I was at spring training when he tried to pitch that next year. He had no control. He had problems with his depth perception. And it was sad because you could see he was really trying. He really wanted to come back. But physically, he just couldn't get it done. After three years of sporadic success in the minors, he was released by the Astros in the spring of 1984. That ended the baseball career of J.R. Richard. And then there's the poignant story of J.R. Richard. He apparently reached the end of the baseball line today. The six foot, eight inch right-hander was just 19 when he joined the Houston Astros in 1969. He went on to win 107 games as a strikeout artist, but he never recovered from the effects of a near fatal stroke in 1980. Today, the Astros gave Richard his unconditional release, saying he will pursue a career other than baseball. J.R. Richard is 34. But the downward spiral of J.R.'s life only accelerated. He lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in bad investments. He got divorced twice. He lost his suburban Houston home. He was struggling. I mean, he was trying to really cope with what happened. It was then, in the late 80s and early 90s, that his friends lost track of J.R. Richard. I remember thinking that I'm worried and he's going to be in a bad place sooner or later. It was, you know, winter of 94. I was making the U-turn underneath the overpass. I see some homeless guys, and I see this big, tall guy, and that looks like Jay. I, uh, I had an intern go and find this big guy and, and ask him his name, who he, who he was. And lo and behold, it was J.R. Richard. I was up there, and I had went to a garbage dump and found uh, a piece of plywood, which I laid up there, and I could lay on that plywood, you know, every, every night. I had a friend across, you know, that lived close to me. I went over his house and stayed with him. But at that time, I was homeless. And I was just stunned for a guy of his stature to have fallen that far to where he was out living, you know, just a, a step above an animal. Remember how sad I thought that was, that a guy who could have been a Hall of Fame baseball player had lost everything. He was down to living under a bridge, under a freeway. Wow. And you're talking about a man that had $10 million when $10 million was worth $30 million. He was that person. He was that icon. And everybody thought about J.R. Richards as that person on the mound, not J.R. Richards under a bridge. I said, we got to help him. And I think that's when Enos Cabell stepped in. And, and hired him um, at his dealership. And, you know, and then a church uh, became involved. We took him under our spiritual wings and he was in the church with us and ultimately I licensed him and then ultimately I ordained him in the church. And uh, I guess some of that spiritual thing transcended into eliminating some of the shame in that. How you done? God bless. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, brother. What's up, sir? All right. Thank you. Good to share. God gave him his life back, and that's where he is right now. So he's doing a lot of good things uh, here in Houston. 
That's who I am. Everything's about God now. It's totally different. I don't go to places I used to go. I don't do the things I used to do. I don't run with the crowds I used to run with. I have totally made a, a change. Here's a fella that had all of the ability in the world, finally learns how to harness it, and he only has it for a small fraction of, of his life. When I think about J.R. Richard, I think about potential. I think about a screaming fastball. It's so sad that he was cut down like that in his prime, and he really was in his prime. When I think about J.R. Richard, I think about the most dominating right-handed pitcher I've ever seen. And I think about what could have been. We can all think on a hypothetical level what could have happened or what would have happened. But at the same time, after all this is said and done, I'm still here. I'm still alive. Sun is shining. Life is great. It's chilling. It's chilling. You, you think about where he was, arguably the best pitcher in baseball, being homeless. And then in 2010, he's, he's come back. It's as heartwarming as a baseball comeback could be. That's your life that you're talking about. I don't know that there's ever been any more poignant story in the history of sports than J.R. Richard. Now 60 years old, J.R. Richard continues to live in Houston and he remains a presence in the community. As you just saw, he still harbors some resentment about how he was treated by the Astros, but he and the team are presently on friendly terms, and in fact, he's been to several Houston games this summer. To date, that is the sometimes glorious and often tragic story of J.R. Richard. So long from Studio 3.